I'm Donna Lewis, and welcome to Transformed TV. Today on Transform TV, we are going to take the deep dive into forgiveness. Before we get rolling into the subject of forgiveness, I want to acknowledge that there are some very strongly held beliefs surrounding what forgiveness is, the requirement of forgiveness, and how it impacts our health and our healing and our relationship with Jesus Christ. Before we go too deep, I also want to acknowledge this. I am not advocating in this video by any stretch of the imagination that it is okay or healthy or reflective of the nature of God to maintain an attitude of bitterness, an attitude of resentment or revenge against those who have harmed us. I do want to advocate this, that we have misunderstood forgiveness. And in doing so, we have actually set people up to struggle in areas they don't need to struggle in. And with that being said, let's dive in. Peter had a very good question for Jesus. We find it in Matthew 18. It begins on verse 21. Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone, someone who sins against me? Seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. He then goes on to tell Peter a very famous parable about an unforgiving servant. The parable that Jesus told Peter is found in Matthew 18, verse 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. That would be equivalent to millions of dollars today. But as he was not able to pay, his man, master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and that payment be made. The servant fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will repay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion released him, and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servant who owned, owed him a hundred denarii, the equivalent of a few thousand dollars today. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay all the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. So my heavenly Father will also do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. 
Matthew 18 is full of beautiful, clarifying verses to help us better understand and gain a fuller perspective of this important and vital subject of forgiveness. If we look at Matthew 18, verse 15, which precedes Peter's question and the parable that Jesus gave as an answer, we see this. It's Jesus speaking. Matthew 18, verse 15. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. What we see here is that when we come into conflict with another person and they do something hurtful to us, we are commanded by God to go to that person and make them aware of the transgression in the relationship. We aren't allowed to sit there and get bitter and angry and gossip about that person. Do you know what they did to me? Or give them the silent treatment. Well, I'm just never going to speak to you again. You hurt me. I'm just never going to speak to you again. No, no. That is not okay, according to God's word. We are told that we must go to that person in private and make them aware that they have hurt our relationship, that they have done damage. Oftentimes, that person may be unaware that they did this, and they will immediately reconcile with you. And then forgiveness takes over, and it's as though it had never happened. Well, let's move on. What if they don't want to see it? What if you come to that person and say, hey, I was hurt when you did this thing, and they're refusing to acknowledge it. They're being stubborn. They're being prideful, and they, they don't want to see that they have harmed your relationship with them. It gives us further instruction in verse 16. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So then... This is where a counselor would come into play or an impartial third party that can hear and, and, and help you both understand each other. And they can actually see from a better perspective possibly and help you both make peace. But what if the person still refuses, still refuses even after you bring in an impartial third party to help the process of forgiveness along. Then what do you do? Verse 17. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, so then we bring even the whole body of Christ into it. We bring... Um, we bring it before the whole body and say, listen, I want to reconcile with my, my, my friend here. I want to reconcile. I want to make this situation right. But if he refuses even to hear from the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth, will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And he goes on to talk about the power of prayer. So what we see here is that forgiveness is a transaction. When 
when Jesus died on the cross and said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He was opening the door for forgiveness. He, he created, he took all the wrath on himself. He took all the malice, all the hatred. He took it all on himself. And he, he did the justice for our sins. But in order for that transaction to be complete, we must come to him and acknowledge that we sinned against him. Let's look at 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. What I see in these two passages is that the evidence that we are sincerely desiring to walk in relationship with Jesus Christ and with one another is that we do not have any darkness in our motives or in our behavior. We desire to and we will to walk in a pure and loving manner, just as God walks in a pure and loving manner. Let's move on. If we say that we have no sin, and now we are in verse 8, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, this is key here, brothers and sisters. This is key here. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So what we see here is two very important things. First and foremost, in order to receive the forgiveness that Christ opened up for us on the cross, we have to be truthful before him and say in agreement with him, yes, I have transgressed our relationship. I have a debt that I am unable to pay. Now the beautiful thing is, those debts are past, present, and future. <laughs> Once and for all. Our debts that we accrue are every unloving, unkind, untruthful deed and motive that we have had from birth to death. But we have to acknowledge that intentionally before the high court of heaven, before God. And we have to confess that sin to him. In that moment, he is indeed faithful and just to forgive us those debts. So now going back to the parable and the discussion between Peter and Jesus, how is it that we 
avoid becoming that unrighteous, unforgiving servant that was forgiven the huge debt, yet refused to pass along mercy and forgiveness to a person who owed him so much less money. How do we fulfill and obey the very severe admonishment from Jesus when he said, if you don't forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. I believe that it is important to look at the preceding conversation that took place earlier in Matthew 18. When he was discussing going to a brother or sister that had done something wrong and confronting them. And then later, Peter asks, well, how many times should I forgive my brother? And Jesus says, not just seven times, but 70 times seven. Let's look at what Jesus was describing and the understanding that he and Peter had. In this particular conversation, Peter had the understanding that he had gone to his friend, told his friend that they had done something wrong, and the friend had acknowledged it and they'd forgiven him. So let's just set up a scenario here. You and your friend are cooking in the kitchen together. Your friend steps on your foot. You say, ouch, you stepped on my foot. Your friend goes, oh, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. You say, okay, I forgive you. You move on. Now you're cooking some more in the kitchen and your friend steps on your foot again. And you say, ouch, you stepped on my foot again. And your friend says again, I am so sorry. Would you please forgive me? And you forgive them. Well, on and on and on and on and on this goes. The same cycle. Friend steps on your foot. Friend asks for forgiveness and you forgive them. I would think that by the seventh time, you would start to get pretty annoyed. And you would be like, why can't you keep those clumsy feet off of my feet? But the friend is always sincere. The friend is always deeply saddened that they hurt your foot. You forgive them. And not just seven times. If it happens 70 times, seven times, you forgive them each and every time. But what is taking place here? An offense. They step on your foot. A confession of the offense. A request for forgiveness from the offense and then you granting them the forgiveness. Now let's look at the parable. The servant that was forgiven a tremendous debt by the king leaves the presence of the king, gets a few hundred yards down the street and sees someone who owes them money. This would be the equivalent of your friend stepping on your foot and you taking them by the collar and shaking them and choking them and saying, you stupid, ignorant fool, get out of my house. I never want to see you again. And them saying, please, please, I'm so, so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. I didn't mean to step on your foot. Would you please forgive me? And you say, no, you are an ignorant, fool and I never want to see you again. Get out of my house and I'm going to tell everybody in our neighborhood what an ignorant fool you are. This is what Jesus was talking about. If we refuse to forgive when somebody asks for forgiveness, we are behaving just like that unrighteous, that unrighteous servant. We are not extending grace and mercy to the person who hurt us. We are not even extending them an opportunity to make it right with us. We're just sending them out on their way, giving them the silent treatment and then exacting revenge on them. It isn't a case of someone 
doing this to you. Sneaking into your house, stealing everything you have, going out and selling it for a fortune on eBay. You finding out about it, you going to them. Friend, I extended my hospitality to you and you took great advantage of me. You stole my possessions, my dearest and most cherished possessions. You sold them in, on eBay and I will never get them back. And you made a fortune on that. Now, all I ask is for you to acknowledge it. I'm not even gonna ask for the money back. I just want you to acknowledge what you've done and that you've hurt me deeply. Will you acknowledge it? Will you just acknowledge it? Now, if they say, oh, my friend, I am so sorry. I did you wrong. I did you wrong. Will you please forgive me? That is where forgiveness takes place. But if they come to you and say, I never did that, you confront them. I never did that. <laughs> You're crazy. What's wrong with you? Maybe you need to see a doctor. Maybe you need some meds, bud, because that never happened. And they go on their way. See, this is where the cycle that Jesus outlined in Matthew 18 needs to take place. Because you have somebody that is in a very dangerous position there. They are not walking in truth. And they are indeed endangering themselves of hellfire. So you, in your grace and your mercy and compassion, must pursue them according to the principles laid out to see that they are restored. But if they refuse, even after you complete the entire cycle to the extent of even bringing it before the church, then that's where you have to exercise what's known as no contact you now have to lay up some pretty serious boundaries between you and them because number one, they're walking in a very dangerous path. And if you try to engage in relationship with them, you're gonna get hurt and maybe it could cost you your life. It's dangerous to continue on a cycle with somebody who is that depraved and that abusive. These are the principles and these are the distinctions that it's very important to understand when we talk about forgiving and the transaction of forgiveness. I want to make it clear that forgiveness and doing good to your enemy are two separate things. Because forgiveness, i.e. reconciliation, is not always possible. We must still have an attitude of forgiveness within our heart. An attitude that I will do good to my enemy. I will bless my enemy with peace. I will intercede for my enemy to receive forgiveness from God. Even though having forgiveness in real time may not be possible. Let's wrap this up. We've discussed five very important principles as it pertains to forgiveness. Principle number one, Jesus takes forgiveness very seriously. That brings us to principle number two. If we desire to be forgiven by God, we must also be willing to extend forgiveness to each other. Principle number three, it is important for us to recognize that forgiveness is a two-party transaction between us and God, between us and another person. Principle number four, forgiveness requires both parties to acknowledge the truth. As it pertains to us and God, 
we must acknowledge the truth that we have sinned against him. We have fallen short of the holy standards he has laid out in his word. That in violating those standards, we have violated our relationship with him. And we need his forgiveness. In an interpersonal relationship between two people, it requires us to be truthful that, number one, a violation of the relationship has taken place. The person who has been violated must be willing to acknowledge the truth that there is a problem within the relationship. They must bring that problem to the attention of the person who's done the harm. The person who's done the harm must be willing to listen and absorb the information being given to them, recognize that the relationship has been harmed and that they are the ones who have harmed it, and then come to an agreement that forgiveness is needed. Then the person who has harmed extends the forgiveness to the person requesting it. Reconciliation takes place. Forgiveness is completed. Principle number five, and this is our last principle. As children of God, we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. That means we follow God's example to us in extending that reconciliation, that opportunity to be reconciled to others. And Matthew 18 lays out a beautiful roadmap for us to follow. We mimic God by mimicking the Matthew 18 principle. You see, God sent prophets to us to let us know that we violated our relationship with God. He sent his son Jesus to us to again remind us and let us know that we've harmed our relationship with God, but he is going to make a way for peace with God. It's up to us to receive it. And then the reconciliation is complete. I pray this information is helpful to you and clear. For further study, go to Matthew 18. And then there's Bible study tools on my website, toxictotransformedlife.com. God bless. That's it for this week on Transform TV. Share with me your comments and your ideas, your, uh, the things that you might be struggling with, prayer requests, areas that you need greater clarification on. I tell you what, tell me your favorite ice cream. I don't care. Leave it in the comments. Also, hit the subscribe button and hit the like button. Share this video with your friends, and I will see you next week. In the meantime... Be transformed.